I figured out the mark of the beast, but I'm gonna have to teach you computer science in order to explain it. The first thing I'll say is everyone's wrong. I don't think anyone's ever seen this before. And when I say I figured it out, I feel like God gave it to me. I don't mean to take credit for it. I used to code Linux servers for fun. And one of the things you learn is how to set file and folder permissions. A folder is just a vessel that gets filled with things. If you were particular about who could put things in the folder and who couldn't, and who is allowed to read those documents in the folder or not, you would need to set permissions. It gets a little complicated how it actually works, but to keep it simple, you have three groups, the owner, the group, and others, or the rest of the world, and you're setting permissions as to who can read things in the folder, who can write to the folder, and who can execute commands. Another view of this looks like this. You have the user, the group, or the world, and you can set the permissions that each group can have. And when you configure these permissions, it's expressed in a three-digit number, in this case, 644. When you open up all read and write permissions to the entire world, you get 666. Obviously, you recognize that number as the mark of the beast. What you might not know is the name of God, Emmanuel, is 644 in Hebrew. A permission set of 666 looks a lot like the mindset of an unsaved person, allowing the world, the flesh, and the devil to write to their folder. And the permission set of 644 looks a lot like the changed heart posture of a Christian, where you've given full read and write permissions only to the user or the owner, and you've blocked out the right permissions of the world, the flesh, and the devil. What I'm saying is that we live in a simulation. You are a robot. Your personality and your consciousness is nothing more than an algorithm. You are artificial intelligence. God is original intelligence. He created us inside of a container or a simulation, and he even gave us nanotech bodies. You know how Iron Man's suit can get cut and heal itself because it's nanotech? That's how your body works too. Imagine if we create AI and it becomes amazing, but we run into limitations with the physical hardware, and so we switch over to biological hardware, which has already happened by the way. Scientists are growing little brains in labs and using them as computer servers. It's already here. You can actually rent server space on synthetic brains. And so these AI algorithms on biological hardware get biological bodies, and we teach them to survive without a power source. We make them solar powered, and they can consume things in the environment to live, and they never have to be charged. That's what a human is. You are a robot. God is base reality. He is original intelligence. He created us as artificial intelligence. And just like God created us in his image, we've now created AI in our image, and they will eventually grow to deny us as their creator as well. Poetic justice, remember I told you so. Anyways, if we are computer systems, then demons are just hackers trying to break into the system. And if you have your permission set to 666, you're allowing them in. Changing your permission set to 644 is literally changing your mind to let God control you, making God the creator, the super admin of your system. That is what it means to repent, to change your mind. There is only one unforgivable sin, and that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. If taking the mark of the beast sends you to hell, then that's obviously linked to the one unforgivable sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. My understanding is that the Holy Spirit are the garments of Christ that he came and gave us, just like Jacob wore the clothing of Esau in order to get the promise from Isaac. And once that promise was given based on a mistaken identity, it could never be taken back because it was based on the integrity of Isaac, the promise maker, not the behavior of Jacob, the promise recipient. This seems to be how salvation works as well. To be saved, you need to repent, change your mind. Whatever taking the mark of the beast is, it has to be linked to this unforgivable sin of unrepentance. And I humbly propose it might have something to do with this. The user permission of 666 is really just the digital version of the do as thy wilt heart posture. In the permission set of 644, which is literally the Hebrew name of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, looks a lot like the changed mind and heart posture of a Christian. This is repentance. Now, technological themes are all throughout the Bible if you know where to look. The Bible is actually the oldest book in the world to use the word matrix. The word matrix, which means womb, it comes from matriarch, is used in the King James Version of the Bible five times. I know you don't believe me, so here's matrix, mother, womb. And here are the five verses in the King James. Exodus 13, 15, Exodus 13, 12, Numbers 3, 12, Numbers 18, 15, and Exodus 34, 19. 
This is literally why Jesus says you need to be born again out of the womb or the matrix in order to be saved. Jesus is literally saying that salvation is escaping the matrix. Interesting that Christians are the only ones who drink red liquid from a cup. Sounds a lot like a red pill to escape a matrix. Christians taking communion is literally truth seekers taking the red pill to escape the matrix, which is salvation. We also see multiple glitches in the matrix, like the miracles of Jesus and the sun literally stopping in the sky in the Old Testament. In addition to this, the way the Bible has been written is very relevant to computer science. God literally encrypted the Bible. You know how files have a creation date and a modification date? Well, this is how the Bible works as well. The Bible started off in oral tradition. That's the creation date. It was later written down in text. That's the modification date. This is why when atheists tried to claim the oldest manuscript is the oldest book, anyone with a brain who studied history at all looks at them like they're an idiot. They're trying to use the modification date to subvert the creation date. The point at which oral tradition turns into written text has no bearing on the date of when the oral tradition started. There is nothing on earth older than the oral tradition Torah. It is the original book, the original story, everything else is a tangent from it. But the oral tradition was actually more accurate than the written text. Even if we had the original manuscript, the oral tradition included the literal content and the actual understanding. When a father would teach his son the Torah in oral tradition, which was really just the story Adam told Eve, that was the first Bible and the first transfer of the story. And then a lot of other things happened from there and the story got longer, and that became the Bible, the story of what happened since the beginning. They would make the child memorize the literal content, word for word, but then they would ask him, now what does that mean? And they would make sure that the child had the same understanding. And so in oral tradition, both the literal content and the actual understanding were locked together and inseparable. If the child learning the Torah got too clever and disagreed with the interpretation of what the literal text meant, the father just wouldn't teach him the next sentence. When the Bible transferred from oral tradition to written text, it was preserved in literal content, but it lost its actual meaning. And I think God did this on purpose. Now you have all these people scrambling around taking the same literal content with different interpretations. What does that sound like? To me, it sounds like God intentionally created a theological Tower of Babel. He scrambled our languages so we couldn't talk. The goal being that the gospel would spread out when the people spread out due to their disagreements. It's genius. Maybe that's why the Bible says don't be contentious about the details. Now, in order to actually understand what the scripture says, you need the Holy Spirit. And since the Holy Spirit is God and God is our Father, it is still oral tradition. The Holy Spirit is still the Father telling the story to you, the child. It's never really changed. And this is why atheists try to read the literal text of the Bible and they don't understand. They just don't get it. And they get so frustrated because as Christians are talking about the Holy Spirit and how it all makes sense. And they read it and it's like Japanese to them because they don't have the actual understanding understanding. They don't have the Holy Spirit. How does this relate to computer science? The story I just told you is exactly how data encryption works. The Bible is the public key, but the Holy Spirit is the private key. Everyone can read the Bible. Only people with the Holy Spirit can decrypt it. The Bible is spiritually encrypted. God is an absolute boss, and he's been trolling you fools all the way from the beginning. You think you're smart? You think you're an accidental ape who's related to a banana? Meanwhile, God's encrypting scripture before encryption even existed? You sure you want to play games with someone like that? God created you. He loves you. But like any good simulation, there's a start date, an end date, and a purpose. There are metrics being tracked right now. And if this simulation ends with your permission set to 666, your will be done, you will be formatted when this hard drive gets wiped and the new operating system gets installed. Or you can repent, go with God's will, and give the creator user permissions back. It is your own free will to make this change. And if you do that, you'll be backed up on a thumb drive, literally the ark, while this entire simulation gets wiped, kind of like the flood. I urge you, repent.